Hello, Oscillate Sync here. One of the things that gripped me at Superbooth was the Lep Luminoi series of instruments. They seem to possess that arcane electronic magic that interests me these days. So I got in touch with Lep and they kindly agreed to send me across some of the instruments in that series to make a video about. Namely, the Luminoise V4, the Monocasa, and the Lumamix Resonant Mixer. In this video, we're going to get to know them individually and in concert with each other and other instruments, explaining the features and exploring their sounds along the way. The overarching theme of the Luma series is that of light being used to control the instruments in some way, via light-dependent resistors and solar panels, usually as a modulation source, but in some cases as part of the sound-making circuit itself. For me though, in these three that I have here at least, there is another common vibe, and that is that they seem to harken back to a primordial era of electronic music. They feel primitive in a good way, visceral, raw, and sometimes dangerous in a way that I find really exciting as a music maker. We'll get to know them in just a moment, but if you enjoy this video, don't forget to drop a like on it and let me know what you think in the comments. This video is kind of long because I made it, but I've put extensive chapter markers in the description, so don't feel shy about jumping around to the topics that interest you. For now though, let's get amongst it. is a four voice drone synth with a resonant low pass filter. That's a description which is accurate but probably inadequate. And as I've spent the last few weeks with it, I found that it's a synth which encourages discovery. Even last night as I was making final preparations for this video, it started making sounds that I hadn't heard it make before. And it's quite exciting. Let's break down exactly what's going on here as far as I can explain. And then see where it can take us. Let's begin by giving an overview of the architecture of the synth to begin with. So uh, there are four voices, and each of those voices has a volume and a frequency control. And these voices sum together through a low pass filter. This filter doesn't go to nothing. I don't know what the topology of it is actually. But what I can tell you is that the resonance does that mogi thing where it starts to de-emphasize the low end a little bit. The filter will also ring out on its own if we take the volume down altogether. It will self-resonate. I'm controlling the cutoff there with the knob. And you'll notice that the knob goes backwards as far as conventional wisdom goes. I like to think of it as getting more cutoff. <laughs> uh, it can also be controlled using an LDR as well. So if we flip the switch, We have control over 
uh, the cutoff fire the amount of light, and if I bring the lights closer, it will get brighter. You'll also have heard something else happen there, which we'll get to. I'm just going to switch it back to the pot for the moment. Now, I've been careful to use the term voice and not oscillator, because although this has four voices, it actually only has one oscillator, and each of the voices are created by way of taking that single oscillator and using frequency dividers to derive new pitches. And you can kind of hear that in action as we turn the frequency control can hear it snapping to each of those different sh slots, if you like. You'll also notice that, as with the cutoff, you turn the frequency knob up to get a lower pitch, as in more division, if you like. The range of these knobs is pretty wide but you can tailor it goes right down into the clicks quite happily you can tailor their range by using this switch here low medium and high now low medium and high doesn't mean that the lowest pitches are found on the low setting uh, in fact you'll find the lowest pitches right down into the clicks are found in the high. We're talking about a range here, so in the low mode here, the difference between the highest and the lowest pitches is the smallest, and as we go up here, the actual range becomes wider, which can make it harder to tune. It also seems to have some other effects which we'll explore in a moment. So, uh, the first three voices here all operate in the same way. Frequency division off of that first uh, oscillator. Voice 4 is slightly different. It works off of voice 3. So if I turn down voice 3 altogether and have voice 4 turned up, if I change the pitch of voice 3, it's going to change the pitch of voice 4, and voice 4's frequency control divides down off of whatever voice 3 is doing. And these oscillators have some serious, serious weight to them. Like the low end here. is actually kind of mad. Which is why having the resonance control taking out a little bit of that extreme low could be quite useful. So the pitch of the main oscillator is dictated actually by how much light is hitting that LDR there or how much uh, resistance is being shown at this input here. Now, my one complaint about this instrument is the fact that you can't just turn off this control on the LDR. And as you go to change knob values, you will tweak the pitch. That kind of chaos and intrigue is interesting in some types of performances, but not in every performance. So the hack that I've got here, and I'll probably use this for a good chunk of the demo, is I've just got a 
patch cable and I've just wrapped a bit of wire between the tip and the sleeve, essentially bridging those two, shorting them. And if I plug in here, that provides a constant um, resistance, which means we don't get any weird movements in the pitch. One theme I found with most of the LEP devices that I have played with is this idea of internal overdrive. So we have these volumes here and I've got them all at 12 o'clock so halfway up and you can already hear that it's starting to overdrive the filter somewhat kind of got that crackle in there it's burning it and we're only at halfway which means that we can push these frequencies harder into that filter and have them fight for space ways. This gets really interesting and one thing I've been playing with loads on this device is that pretty much all of the oscillators can go down into sub audio range essentially into an LFO range. And what that's going to do is basically act like a moving DC offset bumping into the headroom of the filter and it means we can get to behave almost like a an LFO Other thing that is a feature of this synth is that for whatever reason, if you move the volume controls too fast, starts to, I don't know, it does something with the summing, which makes everything sort of cut out. Now, you have to be aware that this is going to happen, because in the heat of the moment you don't want to do that by accident, but as another sort of performance element, you have all of this additional modulation, finger modulation, that's really complex. Yeah. There is one knob we haven't actually spoken about yet, and we really rather should this one up here. So what is this control which is labelled 
XXX. Well, the manual describes it as kind of like control, but more sexy. And who am I to argue with what the manual says? Indeed, as we turn it, we will affect the pitch of all of our different voices. But you can probably hear in there, as it's happening, there's some other stuff happening in there as well. And this is where a lot of the discovery has occurred because and I don't know all the details here there seems to be some kind of feedback involved in what's going on here Because changing the pitch of some of these oscillators, or even the volume sometimes, feels like it changes and affects what's going on with the other ones. I can hear other frequencies snapping into existence here. To borrow a phrase from another synth creator that I very much Acknowledge as one of the greats, one of the modern synth designers of our time. It feels a little organismic. It feels like the different parts of the synth are having an effect on each other. behaviour seems to be somewhat different depending on what the range is set to as well. And there are some sounds that I've heard coming out of this. can't completely com explain.
So here I've got three of the four voices running at sub-audio rate. Just clicking away inside the filter and adding a drone. Sounds like another pitch sequence happening in there. XXX control, our sexy transpose. There are so many. <laughs> what is going on there? So many interesting. Textures, rhythms, sometimes. To be uncovered. Weird semi arpeggios. Intermodulations. I would maybe describe as being the rawest realization of the idea of a drum machine. I'd maybe go so far as to even call it primitive, not in a derogatory way, but as, just as a descriptor that I think is accurate. It's generating its drum sounds in what is, I think, the most primitive way you can achieve it, which is pinging a resonant filter. So let's talk about the structure of the synthesis architecture here. Uh, we'll start with what is doing the pinging. There is a constant clock source. There are some things we can do with it, which I will get to, but we have a tempo here. The clock source goes up into audio rate, so you can 
get a tone from it. So that's our sequencer, if you like. And that's going into a resonant filter. We have control over the cutoff. Just going to affect the pitch of our drum sound. And the resonance, just going to affect how it rings out. That filter then runs into a distortion. And that can be used to add overtones to the attack. here is a trigger mix. So this is where we come to these two little, what look like the little eyes on the face here. With this knob all the way to the left, you're feeding as much of the clock source in there as possible. And as you go to the right, it's going to crossfade into whatever is plugged in here. Now obviously I don't have anything plugged in here, so it's just crossfading to silence. which kind of just gives us a velocity control. Because of its simplicity, although we can get some pretty cool tones out of it when we're just playing, system, but we'll get to that when we bring out the third device that we're going to talk about. So let's pair this with some other friends. If I had one bone to pick with the Monocasa from a sonic perspective, it's that this clock source, which is used to ping the filter, has quite a, an aggressive attack, which can be useful, especially when you start to bring in the distortion stuff, but I kind of favor more mellow sounds in a lot of cases. So um, 
One thing that is an absolute beautiful pairing with the Monocasa is a passive low pass gate. So I've just got the little Pusherman um, 0 HP one here. And if we bring down its tone control, some of that clicky attack is tempered somewhat. So all I've got going on here is the output of the monocaster into the input of the low pass gate, the output of the low pass gate out into my interface, and then the uh, trigger for the low pass gate is just the clock source, uh, which is what this jack is for. So this outputs the clock source. Uh, the Pusherman low pass gate is lovely. It's got a lovely long natural pinging release. You can recommend it. And a tone control so we can decide how dark we make things. So that's a really nice pairing, of course. But now we're in this situation, let's talk about the trigger mix and maybe put something more interesting into here, shall we? So I've added the ever useful Korg SQ1 to the setup here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that trigger for the low pass gate and pop it in there instead. And I'm also going to take the same gate output that I just malted in this setting here and bring it across into that trigger. And now we have a programmable drum machine. wanted to sort of make use of the original trigger as well, we could um, also clock the SQ1 from the tempo. Just catch up now, there we go. And we can still use the tempo control here. mixing together the two trigger sources, the SQ1 and the internal trigger, we can get these weird sort of delay things happening. Because internally it's been triggered, but the low pass gate has only been triggered by the SQ1. Loads of fun. Ah, but I actually want to show one other trick with the SQ1, um, which is kind of a slight sort of misuse of it, I guess. Uh, because at the moment we are sending the gate into the input here, but could also turn off the light control for a second. send in the CV. Let's get all these active steps back on. And what happens when we send the CV in, what creates the triggers is no longer the gates, but rather the difference between the CV. So if I turn all the CVs all the way down, you hear nothing. But if I have one 
difference here. And we get a trigger, essentially. And then a smaller difference makes a smaller sound. I think that's pretty cool. Especially with the distortion. Now, of course, this is still getting triggered off of here, which now is triggering everything. But we could. So that's fun as well. Uh, let's, however, pair this with um, one other piece of gear that I've had loads of fun with. A great way to take a simple beat, especially a beat so simple that it's just a clock, and make it more complex and interesting is to get a tempo synced delay and set that tempo sync delay to some interesting uh, division of the clock. Now, that would be fun, but rather than trying to delay the sound of the monocassa, because we have a clock output and a clock input, instead what I've done is I've taken the clock signal and I'm running that into a delay pedal and then running the output of that delay pedal back into the monocassa. So it's the sequencer essentially that we're affecting which allows us to have that changed beat all be happening inside the resonance of the filter which is where more interesting things happen. So I'm just going to tap in the tempo first. And I've got uh, what are essentially three delays set up here, actually. So I'm just going to turn the, f the second one off. Um, and if we turn up the trig mix, we should hear... And we have another set of clocks in there. Now, at the moment, they sound kind of boring because it kind of sounds like it's repeating. But as we bring that resonance up, Let me use some of the distortion as well. We can hear that some of them are at different levels. So we get accents and sort of ghost notes. Let's bring the other one in as well.
get some glassy little pinks. in this case, three. On the clock that's pinging the filter, as it turns out, is a lot of fun. So this is probably my favorite way to, to use it, is by having a delay in the clock feedback, as it were. Because it allows you to essentially build more complex sequences. This is something you should maybe play with in modular if that's your world as well. Taking delays to clock signals, especially clock signals which dynamically affect what they're going into. Anyway. introduce the third item in the family which allows me to bring or you to bring in fact uh, these elements together with some others the luma mix is well it's a mixer um, but it's probably not a mixer that you'd want to use in a conventional fashion, in my opinion, anyway. Uh, nevertheless, um, I will start by just sort of giving its vital statistics, because it's probably useful to know about the I.O., but then we'll get on to how I think it's best used in my opinion anyway, how I like to use it. So, let's talk about the I.O. quickly, and the signal flow. So this is a four input mono mixer, so no panning. Each of the inputs has a volume control, however. At the moment we're hearing the rote and the um, micro granny. Apart from input one, all of the IO, so the inputs and all of the other outputs, have both mini jacks on the top and full-size quarter-inch jacks on the back, which is just lovely. I'm sure it is born out of the same frustration that I have, which is never being able to find the adapter that I need when I need it. But in this setup here, it's just made things more ergonomic. It's made things uh, easier to plumb in. I haven't had to use as many adapters. Fantastic. No complaints there. Uh, we then have a send and return. There is no individual send per um, channel so basically whatever is the current mix gets sent out on the send and then uh, you have a volume control for the return so that's the magpie pedals wet set uh, very wet <laughs> on the um, effects and return there now it's worth noting that um, in this configuration, you probably want something that is 100% um, wet uh, on your effect send. Uh, otherwise, you'll get a volume boost of the other stuff when you blend them in. It's maybe not an issue, but it is better to have something that can go um, essentially kill dry uh, in this configuration. 
It's also worth noting that uh, the return can just be used as another input if you don't have need of the effects and you have a volume control. So you can kind of think of return as your fifth channel here as well. All of the signal then gets put through a resonant filter. We have control for cutoff and resonance. You'll notice that this filter doesn't suffer from the same issue or feature, I guess, as the Luminoise V4 in that we don't really lose any bottom end when we pull down that resonance. The filter's multi-mode, so currently it's on low pass, but we also have a band pass. Nice harmonics we can pick out there. And high pass. And then for each of the filter modes, we also have a low, medium, and high range. So the most open sound would be low pass on the high range and the cutoff turned all the way up. Everything goes through the filter, including the uh, return. The cutoff is also able to be controlled by the LDR here. which is nice. Uh, you can turn that off um, if you want with this switch, but to be honest, I kind of leave it on. This is in parallel with the pot. So to get the biggest range, you want the pot turned all the way down. And then you have the most control with the LDR. The other knob that we have here is a gain control. And this is gain going into the filter. And this starts to kind of speak to what I think this mix is really for. Because like the internals of the Luminoise V4, this mixer is very happy to be overdriven. And as you start to overdrive things into the filter, you A, get interesting burbly resonances but also as you can start to hear now quite a lot of crunch and it's through gain staging usually a purely technical exercise that you can start to do creative things and make signals dance and vibrate. Listen to that lovely burbling re resonance there. Let's bring in the uh, Monocasa. Monocasa uh, has an input coming from the clock of Rote, so we'll be in time with what Rote is doing. Here, that as things start to fight for headroom, they begin to dance, almost like a, a pumping that we're getting for free. Bear in mind the gain is pretty low at the moment, so we have loads of space to overdrive things a little bit harder. I'll try and stop the volume from getting out of control in post. But you don't really need to worry about it getting to the point of clipping in many cases because this is clipping internally. Uh, 
turn is happening before the filter as well, so you can overdrive that reverb in this case. Distortion unit. That's the micro granny going mad there.
creates destruction and filth. And I love it. <laughs> love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. How could you not? Recently, I've been thinking a lot about what characteristics really draw me to an instrument. What was it about these three little boxes that drew me in and made this video take so much longer to make as I sat and explored them when I should have been working? There are sonic qualities that I tend to favour, features that I find useful, aesthetics that appeal to me, but when I look at my absolute top tier instruments, things like the Lyra 8, the Electron boxes, the Op 6, None of these factors singularly surround all of my favourites in that imaginary Venn diagram. Indeed, some of those instruments I mentioned are so strikingly different in almost every way that it's almost farcical to think that there would be a singular property that I could point to. But I think I might have found one. I think I'm drawn to instruments with a strong, maybe even opinionated, design philosophy. The instruments I mentioned, as well as the Luminoise boxes featured in this video, feel to me like they were designed by makers who had strong views about what the experience of making music with their creations should be like. The process of trying to interpret, understand and integrate those ideas into your music making is, for me at least, part of their appeal. It's a little bit like you're making music in collaboration with the designer of the instrument. This approach has its risks too, of course. While everyone will at least get on with a more generalist instrument, as one becomes uncompromising in the philosophy behind an instrument, the probability of it becoming divisive grows. But when you vibe with it, you really vibe with it. And for what it's worth, I've already gone out and bought another LEP instrument off the back of my time with these instruments, and it's unlikely to be my last. I hope you enjoyed the video. Until next time, take care. Bye-bye.